Hi, Matthias Juric. I, I hope it's still pronounced perfectly. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Adam. Thank you very much for hosting me. Yeah, and uh, yeah, your pronunciation is excellent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so the last time we had a chat about components, and uh, I already got a feedback that some people are not aligned with my opinions. Uh, so I invited them back so you can hear you know, the feedback in one of the upcoming episodes. But today we wanted just to focus on Cumulus. So this is what we always wanted, but never achieved. So today is all about Cumulus. So right. what I would like to do, maybe this is a good strategy, to start to you know how Cumulus happened very briefly to over micro profile and the idea with Java E and then, you know, the Cumulus and Kubernetes, your current thing, right? So what I understood is uh, you uh, your idea was to have a, a, a lightweight microservice runtime um, and um, and you tried to, not right, you did it and you won the uh, Duke Choice Awards, right? So this was the long story short. So can you just briefly explain it again, how it happened? Yeah, it, it happened like that. Well, um, uh, I was really active in the service-oriented architecture uh, some 10 or 15 years ago or, or even more. And we all know that service-oriented architecture had its problems, particularly with web services bound to the to the to these huge monolithic applications and so on. And, well, uh, we, we played a lot what to do, how to progress. And then the APIs came over and the idea of microservices and uh, well, uh, uh, it started in different languages. We followed all these, and then we thought, well, uh, what if we would try to uh, uh, do a lightweight uh, runtime environment? Well, uh, I personally and my team, we have always been Java EE fans, and we have done a lot of EJPs and, well, uh, the, 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 the traditional Java EE architectural programming style. And at that moment, we thought, well, what would be needed to get a lightweight runtime? What What is really needed in, in microservice environment and so on? And uh, once you start thinking, you you, you, you um, quickly um, realize that not all Java E technologies are necessary, that you can skip EJBs, you can replace them with CDI and so on. And yeah, at that time, we started to mess around with microservices and we came up with the idea of a lightweight runtime environment with no app server. Uh, this is also the time where um, containers started to emerge and so on. So, so things somehow started to match and, uh, well, um, uh, we, we didn't have, we never had the manpower to, to develop everything from scratch. So we, we are actually based, uh, our microservice framework on existing open source projects. Uh, for example, Jetty Server is the core of, of of what we are using in Cumulus EE. Yeah, and that's how it started, actually. Uh, we, we started working on that in 2013 and then 14. And in 2015, we had the first version of the Cumulus EE framework, which was okay. We already used it in some production projects on our site. Uh, so we, we we actually uh, 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 prove that the, the 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 framework can work with production applications, that it can scale and everything else. And then we well we thought should we present this on Java one? And well, uh, we first we first submitted a, a, a presentation there, but it was not accepted. Uh, actually, we got quite. Uh, uh, feedback, why are we doing this, that app servers are something which is traditionally part of Java E, and I wasn't sure that everybody really understood uh, this idea. But after that, uh, well, uh, we were told uh, better than having a presentation on Java 1, let's try with, with the Duke Choice Award, and then we submitted for the Duke Choice Award and won it, yeah, and at that year. Uh, but uh, I mean, we, to to win a Duke Choice Award is even better than presenting at Java One, right? So it, it was, is, it, <laughs> it was, is, yeah. Sure. And and I guess <laughs> after winning the Duke Choice Award, you had no problem speaking at Java One then, right? <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, uh, next year we got a slot there. Yeah, exactly. I, I was speaking at Java One also before. Yeah, uh, but but not on this topic, not on the microservices and so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so uh, since then we are working on. Cumulus EE, 
um, uh, then uh, a, a at, at, at the time of the Java One, what was it? 2016, 15. When was the Duke Choice Award? Do you remember that? The Duke Choice Award was 2015. 15. Is okay, because six I, years ago, yeah. I, I I remember the ceremony, so uh, I attended. It was outside, uh, you know, between the hotels with uh, nice right. weather, right? And uh, you were on stage, and this was like you could uh, order cocktails and stuff and watch, you know, the ceremony. So it was a really nice evening, and um. And back then, was Cumulus a FedChar framework, or was it always layered at the beginning? Um, it was always layered, uh, well, quite similarly as it is today. But in the first version, we only uh, supported the exploded mode. So we okay. didn't have this as a Uber jar or as a Fed jar yet. Mm -hmm. We only uh, supported exploded version. And then after that, we added this backing to jar and all the other features. Uh, and then in 2016, and then later in 2017, this micro-profile idea emerged. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were actually invited... Were you in contact space. with John Klingen on someone from the micro-profile space, or you just watched the spec, and how you got the idea? Or were you in contact with some of the micro-profile folk, folks, or what was... Yeah, yeah we, 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 we still are in contact. We were in contact there mm -hmm. and then, even more than today. Mm -hmm. We still are in contact. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dylan, who well, was then the lead developer of Cumulus E, he then also joined some of the working groups and so on. Mm -hmm. So we we were there, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, our team is small compared to, I don't know, Red Hat or IBM or Oracle. So we, we don't have the manpower to, to participate on all the different parts. But you have a lot of students. Yeah. Well, <laughs> true, yeah. Lazy students, but, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> students, well, uh, there are some excellent students, I have yeah. to say, and some of them even contributed. So Cumulus E is fully open source. It's, it's MIT license, so basically it's free to use. And some of my students even contributed some of the parts. Uh, however, um, you know, we, we have this core team, which... Um, which uh, maintains the Cumulus E framework. And it is important that whenever somebody contributes something, our team takes the code over, checks it, yeah. and make sure that that, that the core team can actually uh, uh, update and maintain the code and so on. So it's not just a one-time contribution. Mm -hmm. This is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then I think in 2018, MicroProfile got the Duke Choice Award. So 2018 was mm -hmm. then the year of Java microservices. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, and as we all know, things are moving very fast. So uh, the Cumulus runtime at the beginning, was it ever Jakarta or Java EE web profile compatible or it only supported parts of the Java EE and Jakarta EE? Uh, we only supported parts of, of, okay. of uh, Java uh, EE and well, micro profile. Most of the web profile. Uh, yeah, we, we, we well, the, the story was like that. Uh, we uh, quickly realized that we need some of the components which are really necessary. The, the most important one is the configuration framework, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. So the config mm -hmm. framework. Yeah. And we basically built our own config framework even before there was the micro profile specification. My colleagues uh, then contributed to the config working group within MicroProfile. So some of the ideas, well, so so to say, the MicroProfile config framework is not that different of what we had in the beginning in mm -hmm. config. But we still have two two different config frameworks: the MicroProfile compliant config framework and our own config framework, because we still have some additional features which MicroProfile doesn't have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so basically, how to configure a tree of uh, of of uh, um, properties uh, and uh, how to use the external config servers. So we we are supporting ECTD mm -hmm. and console since many years now, since really mm -hmm. quite a few years. I think since 2017 or something like that. Yeah, and we use this in in production project and our, also. Our, uh, the users of our framework, they, they rely on it. Yeah. Regarding ETCD, uh, are you using uh, the ETCD as a standalone database or are, or are you picking the configuration for Kubernetes? So what is the usual story between Cumulus and ETCD? Because uh, Kubernetes ships with ETCD. So my question right. is, uh, um, usually, 
is Cumulus working in, in real world projects with a standalone version of etcd or with kubernetes and etcd well we we, we uh, in most cases work with a standalone etcd ah, okay. Interesting. integration yeah because it is not a good practice to use the kubernetes etcd for mm -hmm. applications mm -hmm. yeah this is basically what we follow yeah? mm -hmm. and then you know we, we store there all the different configuration which would otherwise go into the config file or even into the properties or into environment variables and so on mm -hmm. and in a distributed environment where you have a lot of different microservices it makes sense to have some of the configuration uh, written in ectd or console uh, and what we also support is uh, actually the, the 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 live update of the configuration. So once you uh, um, change a value in the ECTD or console, then the microservice immediately is immediately notified that that the config has changed, and you don't need to restart the the, the microservice. Are which you is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Are you implemented this with a webhook? Like, you know, you you get noti notifications from ETCD or you're polling the ETCD? No, we get notifications. Uh -huh, this okay. is a watch mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically you can decide which uh, property in the configuration will be watched. So you simply say watch true. Uh, and then the ECTD makes a callback or the console makes a comeback. Basically, our config framework hides all the details yeah. what what is behind. But yeah, we we we, we do we do a callback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just yeah. looked at the ATCD. Uh, I used it as well, and they they come with a REST more or less REST protocol where you can uh, subscribe. And this was I was just curious what what you are doing, and right. and which right. um, how you configure this? Are you using a ATCD client or what what tool are you using to? to push the configuration to etcd right right so basically uh, we have developed our own tool this mm -hmm. is this is not an open part of the open source framework mm -hmm. uh, but it's our own custom tool with which we can basically um, so if you have i don't know a, a yaml config file mm -hmm. you can simply click which of those values should be automatically transferred to ectd mm -hmm. uh, and then you don't have to manually enter them Okay. Uh, on the other hand, there are some tools, some user interface tools for ECTD and console. None of them is well. None, none of the free ones is really production ready, in my opinion. But nevertheless, they can be used. However, there is one more important thing. Uh, well, uh, all config frameworks and ours as well usually support this layered approach. So you have some of the default values in mm -hmm. the config file, which you can override with environment variables. And then you can override the environment variables with the entries in ECTP or console. Mm -hmm. This is how our config framework works. Mm -hmm. So basically you have all the all the default values still written in config.yaml or, or JSON, whatever format you mm -hmm. prefer. And then whatever you would like to override, you can do either as environment variables or even better in ECT or console. And, and this makes things quite transparent and you don't need all the configuration in ECT and console because some of the configuration doesn't belong there. Yeah, this is what, uh, if you have uh, uh, sensible defaults, they are shipping like, you know, with properties, I assume. And then you just override whatever needed. So like convention of a configuration with ETCD, right? Right. right. So it's similar to MicroProfile. I mean, they also have a hierarchy of of uh, of configuration. Which yeah, uh, yeah. Most, yeah, most of the configuration to, uh, frameworks do something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, do, do you be, uh, your Cumulus became MicroProfile compatible? What yeah, was, what was yeah. it the first time? Uh, well, it was at the beginning. We are there since the beginning, I think, since version 1.0, something oh, like that. Oh, perfect. And yeah, now, yeah, yeah. which version are you supporting? Uh, we are, we are suppo well, production-ready. We are still on 3.3, mm -hmm. but we are now working for, for 4, and now even 5 is coming. So, mm -hmm. so we will have the support really soon. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, do you have your own micro-profile implementation, or are you using uh, a small RAI, for instance, or you are picking other implementations? Uh, for some models, we are using small RAI, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them we have our own implementation. Yeah, for example, the config framework and so on. Okay. Yeah. And is it open source? Could I choose to use Cumulus EE implementation? Let's say for config, is would it be possible or not? 
Yeah, this is possible. All the all the modules, all these extensions, so config, discovery, uh, um, uh, health checks, uh, metrics, uh, everything that we have, everything is open source. So you definitely could could use those modules also independently of Cumulus EE. So, you would just need to do a little bit uh, Maven configuration and dependencies yeah. to to get get it out. Yeah, yeah. Then actually, Definitely. with uh, with Cumulus, we get a, a parts of a micro profile implementation, which is interesting, right? So we we have a Smore, Smore. We have uh, Payara implemented a full thing. Then uh, yours implemented parts, which is great story. So you should announce it somehow on micro profile IO that this module are also implemented by Cumulus. Yeah, right. You are right. Yeah, we 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 could do that. Yeah, because um, uh, because um, what I think what now is more important than years ago that uh, if you like a a just a thing from a micro profile, you can just pick it. You know, um, back then, what I usually used is um, full application service always. I didn't even bother about web profile. I always used the full thing, which makes a lot of sense still. So if you are running Kubernetes, no one cares. But if you are using serverless mode where you know the cloud is the application server then it's more appropriate to pick whatever you you need because it doesn't make any sense you know to ship the entire runtime again and even if it slows down by 300 milliseconds the startup time you will have to pay for the 300 milliseconds so right now i think it's the time for optimization you know 10 years ago i never understood it, the whole lightweight idea and but now uh, it could be useful in serverless and serverless environments, I would say. And what serverless for me means is, is like the cloud is the application server and I just shipping the servlets, kind of like of CGI scripts, whatever, which are lambdas or whatever, or even whole containers could also be. And uh, and uh, if there is no traffic, I don't pay anything. This would be the optimum of serverless definition, yeah. I would say. Um, uh, okay, so uh, great. I agree uh, mm -hmm. with, with serverless and uh, well, even with Kubernetes, uh, the optimizations are really important. Mm -hmm. We had this in mind since the beginning, since Cumulus EE uh, emerged. And uh, I, I still remember there from 2018, there were some uh, performance benchmarks where Cumulus EE had the fastest runtime speed, so starting speed uh, and uh, the smallest memory consum consumptions of all the micro-profile frameworks back then. But then the Graal VM emerged and well, and Quarkus and th those frameworks now really challenge the Cumulus E in those areas regarding the, the startup time and memory consumptions and so on. But uh, 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 in, in serverless, this modularity of the framework becomes really important. Yeah, you, you are completely right. So you, you don't take the whole framework anymore, just, the par just parts of it. Yeah, and well, because um, now what we have, we have a business case. I can I can go to my manager and say, look, if we optimize it for three days and we save half a second and we have one million invocation per month, you will save this amount of dollars. Now right. it's now it's your decision. Right. Should we do it or not? Back then right. it was nothing. So everyone talked to conferences about optimization, but I ask, you know, what do you gain out of that? It, it was nothing. You know, they say, okay. Uh, it starts faster, so okay, I, I'm not interested, right? So it should be simple, yeah. not fast. So <laughs> yeah. that, and, and, that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And yeah. now you can even on Excel show, you know, the, now you have the proof, the 100 percent proof of proof of uh, money saving. Okay, perfect. So uh, you uh, are what, yeah. Sorry. What I wanted actually to point out is that Cumulus E is more than just a micro profile compliant framework. So we have added several uh, extensions or modules. Um, for some additional features, which uh, then have not been part of MicroProfile or still are not part of MicroProfile. What are the most for, interesting proprietary features of Cumulus? Well, I would say um, one of the, the things that we are using really more and more are two modules which are very well connected. This is event streaming and GraphQL support. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this in Cumulus e since quite a few years now, I think since three or four years. Uh, so we we have designed an event streaming module which uh, abstracts the way how we deal with event streaming engines such as Kafka, and we then even added a mapping to Rabbit MQ, so advanced message queuing protocol. So mm -hmm. uh, you have the same syntax uh, from your programming language 
So from the cumulus e microservices, no matter what is the underlying event streaming engine that you use. And as we all know, um, when you get serious with microservices, REST, REST APIs are not enough. Uh, you, you, you have to do a, at least part of the communication asynchronously in such a way. So this, this, this is something what we, we are using. And uh, later on, MicroProfile uh, also, uh, they, they are working on, 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 on such support. I don't know, have in my head whether this is already released or it's still So they have uh, MicroProfile reactive messaging. Right. But this looks right. like uh, message-driven beans, more or less. So you have yeah. one method yeah. and, and uh, they, um, they are invoking the method and they convert the message to a POJO or to a, uh, or to a um, Java data type. And if this method returns something back, you can put an annotation, I think it's input and output. And the input is the incoming topic or incoming and outgoing, sorry. Incoming topic and outgoing topic. Um, is your streaming framework more like POJO based or message based or reactive like Java 8 stream based? Where well, yeah, I would say is a combination of messaging and reactive approach. It's it's quite interesting. It's you can you can very easy. Uh, 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 register a listener and a message, so event stream producer, as we say, mm -hmm. there's also a batch uh, receiving and batch sending of mm -hmm. events uh, supported, and we, we use it in quite a few projects, and the the very good part is that it, it is very well integrated with GraphQL. So the, the streaming you, part? Uh, the streaming part, okay. yeah. If, so if you prefer to use GraphQL instead of REST APIs, then you can connect all those layers quite quite easily. Uh, basically, uh, we, we started this approach. So one of the objectives of Cumulus E has always been how to make developers more productive. Mm -hmm. And one of our first models has been a, a REST core model. We, we call it REST core model. But this module is not a replacement for JAX RS. So it's not a replacement for or, or, or REST client uh, it's not a replacement how to develop REST services. Rather, it is a glue which connects. And so it, it adds a simple way how to do p p p pagination, filtering, sorting, and all the other things which you have to do on, on a REST API. And then it connects it with uh, uh, Java Persistence API. So that basically, once you add the REST core module to your application, you, all your REST services get those features. So uh, filtering, sorting, pagination, and some other uh, features. And um, uh, if uh, somebody calls such a REST service, this call gets translated to the uh, JPA query language format, so it's really easy to connect it with the underlying relational database. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are some, well, small features, but the developers, those who use the Cumulus EA framework, they really love it. Yeah. This reminds and, me on uh, on a extension of Eclipse Link. It was called JPARS. And what, uh, they, what they did, they um, exposed a quite a restful interface. It's actually well designed. And uh, if you if you had a join, for instance, between uh, between tables, they they followed the links. But this was really it was restful. It, they had like you know like author slash ID slash and whatever. So uh, this was well done. I just uh, look it up. It was already in two thousand fourteen. So it sounds similar. So what you did, you exposed the GraphQL API and and implemented resolvers for JPA, right? Uh, well, uh, first we we uh, exposed the REST API. It is a little similar. Well, it is a similar, but our approach was first to base it on the REST API. So basically, to go from the Swagger and then later on from Open API specification down mm -hmm. to the code, and so not the other way around. Not expose the database structure ah. to the to the to the REST uh, API, which I think it's quite important because you know. You 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 do want to have a layer of mapping in between between the REST API and the database model usually yeah uh, and now we extended this to the GraphQL as well yeah uh, mm -hmm. we, which is quite nice so I look uh, it up Kubulusi REST is the project yeah it is mm -hmm. it is yeah we are now working on on some other extensions for 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 GraphQL 
Uh, we are also working for support for JRPC. Mm-hmm. Um, so this Google mm-hmm. Remote Procedure Call, which we are also using in some projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for makes... what? Uh, for uh, as a replacement for REST communication or like remote procedure call or what is going to be? What's the idea of a GRPC? Well, uh, mm, mm, GRPC is, well, we, we, we see it as a good replacement uh, in scenarios where uh, the application is running on multiple mm, data mm-hmm. centers of uh, cloud providers. So routing the routing the uh, uh, calls with JRPC can be uh, can be more um, uh, um, well um, efficient, more efficient and more easy to optimize than than using REST. Yeah, definitely. No, this is what I get. Um, uh, but uh, what you could do, you could, for instance, use the MicroProfile REST client and provide a gRPC protocol. You know, that's true. Is that, that's the, true. that you are using yeah. like uh, no, it looks like let's say a microprofile REST client interface, but it uses gRPC. So my question was like, are you using gRPC as a new spec, like, you know, remote procedure call spec, or you are using gRPC as a protocol, as an alternative to HTTP, but from the outside, it will be still, you know, look look like a, a JAX RS. Uh, the way we have integrated this with uh, with Cumulus E framework is we are using this as a separate RPC mechanism. Okay. Yeah. So you have to code it. Yeah. You have to code it in order to use it. Yeah. But the idea is definitely there. We we have already thought about that. How would this be possible to map? Uh, so this mapping on REST client. Well, this would this this is a really good idea but there are several challenges how to do that because you have those proto buffers and the way the mm-hmm. interface is designed in grpc is more like a method invocation and you you have this uh, interface definition languages proto buffers uh, which do not map directly on the rest semantics mm-hmm. uh, I, I yeah, maybe experiments method... maybe experiments with open api you know so if you could i don't know right. Uh, the right. way from MicroPower is the open API and with an open API and, and, and mapper. But yeah, and another approach would be to say gRPC is remote procedure call. So let's do like RMI back then, remote method invocation over gRPC. This would be actually RMI over gRPC, right? <laughs> yeah, this reminds me of a project. We did that, you know. I was there still quite, quite young, yeah. We did that. I was personally involved in a project where... Uh, there was this RMI with Java remote uh, method protocol, and then RMI was upgraded to over IOP. IOP. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and I worked with IBM Java Technology Center back then uh, to to optimize the performance. Mm-hmm. The RMI IOP was slower than the original R- RMI, and we did quite a few optimization. This was also the topic of my PhD work. So basically, this actually should work. Yeah, this is not a bad idea at all. Uh, this mapping would be more straightforward than mapping the REST clients to GRPC. Because what I really hate opinion. about the yeah. GRPC, you know, they say, okay, GRPC is the new shiny thing, but we had um, RMI forever. And the RMI API is actually great, I have to say. So it's really, really easy to use the newer one. You say, I think, uh, naming.lookup, I think just something like this, naming.lookup, and you and you pass, yeah. p- pass an interface and the port, and you get the interface um surrounded with a dynamic proxy which takes over the communication and i always wondered you know why we just not not use you know something like corba without iop i mean corba could be simplified the, the, the naming service you can strip it up so it, it would be just one static method like lookup return the interface and then i just call you don't we could you know provide runtime exception step of check exception so you get one simple java interface and um this would absolutely work, you know, and the whole entire fiddling of what they did with GRPC and Apache Thrift and whatever I saw, is just remind me, you know, the JDK 1.1 days. We had already the fiddling and, and then we got a great RMI with not as great protocol based on Java serialization, but this could be absolutely replaced. Yeah, uh, you are right. Yeah, the history is repeating a little bit here, yeah. but... Uh... What I really miss from all those newer remote procedure uh, protocols or whatever I would say, so SOAP, REST, GRPC as well, 
in in the RMI days, you had the ability to send classes as a, as a, a parameters or return values of methods. Mm-hmm. You, you don't get that anymore. So you you could send basically the whole class with the whole behavior and this dynamic class downloading simply did the job and you had it on the another mm-hmm. virtual machine in another process. This, this this was really nice, yeah. But it's limited to a, to a programming language. It's very difficult to implement this cross language. Uh, yeah, we could we could say JSON, yeah. JSON B. If we limit yeah. ourselves to JSON B, now we from micro profile or Jakarta yeah. then it would work yeah. because we say whatever yeah. class. Because I don't believe you know the preference call. This was messy. So if you pass a parameter per reference and uh, remotely, this this shouldn't work. So yeah, and and JSON is per definition, um, I mean per copy, value. right? Right. So yeah, no, no one would value. expect per reference. So this yeah. semantic would be clear, and JSON B. Is just great. JSON B could be mapped to Java record, so it means the parameter could be a Java record, which could be in turn an OCLS with JSON B. So Apache, uh, I think Johnson um, already does that, and um, and I, I would say that this would be this would be usable, right? And and we would get another remote procedure call spec in MicroProfile. Why not? So we have RESTful, and. There are many projects. So this summer, I reviewed maybe three projects, and 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 two out of three attempted to misuse Jax OS for remote procedure call. So you know, all the rest calls were Java methods, one to one. And I say, okay, you can do this, but don't call it REST. Call it remote procedure call and HTTP, and you can misuse Jax OS. But what they did, they had you know a package REST, which was not RESTful at all. For me, it was completely confusing because is it now? best practice what they are doing or or I, I i was a little bit confused and then ask them they say yeah well we just wanted to call the methods for this purposes something like this would be great right and this is confusing i, I don't like that uh, to be honest so rest is resource based yeah. and java methods are operation invocation based so you exactly. say i don't know return something or calculate something or something like that but in rest you don't mimic this behavior. You no, but this is very common in projects, like, believe me. So yeah, many, yeah, many projects are just doing this because they, they don't, don't want to think about the APIs, right? But for that, but what, what, yeah, G, GRPC or, or RMI-like approach would be great, right? What I had in mind is basically that the original RMI had the ability that you, that you used classes, you know, Java classes as return or parameter yeah. values of methods. Marshall objects. there was no class, yeah, marshalling objects, yeah. yeah. And if there was no class on the remote Java virtual machine, the dynamic class lo- downloading did the job. Yeah. Okay. Then you are this probably also, also also aware of agents back then. This was the idea of agents, yeah. you know, the egglet framework yeah. where moving right. cl- clothing right. with class loader. Right. So I, I wouldn't go that far right. because now we have no security issues, whatever. But as we would say, we just f- do JSON and then the other side could be JavaScript or whatever. Everyone would understand this. Also, I would, of course, focus on Java, but... If someone would like to use Python, no problem, I would say. Yes, yeah, certainly. Certainly, this is a must-have today in multi-language support. Yeah. But coming back to the Cumulus EE framework, so one, one other thing that we are really using heavily in the project, and I believe once you start doing Kubernetes or even serverless, it becomes really important are the feature flag frameworks. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, feature flags are something... What's the name of the project? It's cumulus e feature flex. Yeah. Feature flex, okay. Uh, so we, we have basically defined uh, a, a, a module where we could integrate different feature flex frameworks. For now, we just integrated one, but nevertheless, what I wanted to say is that this, together with uh, canary release process, uh, which is also an important part of the microservice development, so that you are able to have multiple versions of the same microservice in the runtime environment and then you can route the the traffic um, uh, and then with feature flags you can enable some features or disable them in the runtime this becomes really important uh, at least in in my opinion if you are doing the the, the microservice development as it should be yeah. um, i look so at what, the code I, mean? I look at the code and for me it looks like extension of configuration so uh configuration so you have a code if feature flex is enabled and there is one feature and you are injecting the feature flag so uh it is more like a a semantic extension of configuration right because the feature flags are going to be configured and then at runtime you decide is it enabled or not yeah 
Yeah, that's true. But uh, well, from 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 high level perspective, it's definitely like that. But you know, you you want to have the configuration for your technical uh, configuration and stuff, which is well, what you should configure with your application or microservice, and then you have feature flags with the business or how would I say with the with the with the uh, functionalities which you enable, disable, and once you start mixing these, well, things things get a little bit messy. Uh, unless you do a clear separation, you, you could do this with the config framework. You could separate the technical configuration from this functionality perspective. You definitely could do this. But fe uh, feature flags are, well, these are tools which are already designed for that. And they, 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 they offer you then some interesting additional uh, things like a nice user interface where you can change the values and some history. And then you have groups of groups of users for which you would like to enable some feature and groups of users for, for which you don't want to do this. And you can achieve this more easily than, than, than using the config framework. So I, I believe feature flags will become part of the everyday uh, yeah, uh, uh, they, they are. Developers all, all, yeah. yeah, all big yeah. companies are using this. I was just uh, the technical right. perspective. I was interesting, so interested. Uh, but you are right; it should be separated. And if it is already separated, then it is the way to go. I mean, because otherwise you will have to re-implement the separation with uh, different files. So you will have to extend microprofile config or use like namespaces or whatever, right. which is messy. So it, it and, right. and and then it is not the right approach. So I just. Right. From my understanding, it is, looks like ex technical extension of of uh, of configuration. But can you do yeah. also something with Cumulus, like with feature flags? You could make a Jaxorus resource disappear. That you say, you know, only if this is activated, only then the Jaxorus resource is visible in the API. Well, basically, I believe that would be possible to do. Yeah. Because then yeah. you can, you know, you can turn on and off APIs, so REST endpoints depending on feature flex. This would be a major extension, so major added value feature. Yeah, you, you could that you could do that, yeah. But then you know the, 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 the challenge here becomes how the other microservices would relate to that uh, uh, microservice which would uh, switch on or switch off the, the REST API, how how they would get one, the one of the endpoints. One of and, the endpoints, not and, also than just specific endpoint, right, you know. Right. And you know th there are different approaches how then you can do that. One of them is using the discovery service. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we have this discovery service in Q another C module. Another for, module for is called quite discovery. A long time. Also for quite a long time. However, to be honest, um, well, with with Kubernetes, this discovery model uh, is not that important anymore because with Kubernetes, and particularly if you combine that with Istio. Mm -hmm. uh, or some other service mesh framework, you get this linking and dependency management there, implemented there. So uh, uh, basically, um, <clears throat> basically, uh, it's it's something which is already there if you use Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, and what what we are working on right now, uh, this is something we haven't done, uh, we haven't um, submitted to the open source yet is automating the whole deployment procedure with the canary release mm -hmm. uh, mechanisms um, well um, so w w one of the one of the premises of the microservices is well what i always say is if you are doing microservices right you can deploy each microservice separately you don't need to to batch them up and deploy the whole application at once. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, you start thinking, well, if I deploy a new microservice, should I stop the previous version and just deploy the new version? Or can I simply add the new version to the pool and then um, progressively uh, move the traffic to the new version? Yeah. And well, uh, today there are already several tools which which allow this. We have uh, well, Kubernetes on one side, and Istio, then the Flagger. Flagger is uh, a nice tool which enables you to do this. But um, what, what we are working on is really to simplify uh, in a complex environment where you have I don't know twenty or thirty or fifty microservices. How you how you simplify the whole process. And I think in a few months we will have this tool ready and also submit it to the open source. But uh, you said Kubernetes is, does it already. What Kubernetes does, you, you yeah. will have to to configure the ingress controller, right? 
Yeah, yeah, right. I, I didn't well, I didn't mean that Kubernetes does everything. It provides some means to yeah. Uh, but how to, you will do this to, with Kubernetes? You will have to write your own ingress controller, or you will have to augment somehow an existing one to reroute the traffic, well, right? If if uh, uh, if you use uh, if you use some of the service mesh, uh, uh, ah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Then then um, uh, then. Um, uh, uh, this uh, then this um, then then there you have the features that you need. So what what we actually use is Istio. Okay. Um, yeah, this makes sense. With Istio, you are right because uh, you yeah, can read out yeah. the traffic whatever you like out of the box. So what Istio is, it replaces right. the or it, this is the ingress controller basically. Right. It it makes it simpler. It definitely makes it simpler. There are several solutions already available, but you know the problem with all of those solutions is that. Then, then you have a really complex configuration. You have all those YAML files where you have defined all the versions and everything else, and it becomes it becomes quite complex to manage this. Uh, if you do a demonstration with two microservices, everything is still readable, but once you have really a lot of microservices, things get quite complex, mm -hmm. and it's quite easy to do a mistake, particularly when you go through the environments. If you still have, you know, test and and and. Uh, uh, um, uh, user acceptance and production environments and so on. And if you don't have everything automated, so the ops part, the operations part, you 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 can do some some errors quickly, and then then things wouldn't work anymore. So what what we are focusing on is how to simplify the configuration for such scenarios. But what uh, you will do? So I, I mean, you will have to somehow extend Istio or create an Istio module or, or route the traffic by yourself. So what you are planning to do? Well, we have approached it like that, that you see that the, the, the environment already knows which versions of the of a microservice you have. And then you simply declare, you, you do it in a declarative way. You say, I, I want to have the, rec the, the, the recent three versions of a microservice in my environment. So once I deploy a new version, the discovery service would automatically send the new version and then it would update the roots. Uh, how how the uh, uh, um, uh, how the, the the services are resolved? For example, if I do a lookup for a new service, uh, this could be a REST API or, or gRPC interface or whatever. That I get the newest version uh, if I meet some criteria, and that criteria is then defined in the in the Canary release configuration file where you say, uh, for example, you do 5% of new clients, you 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 you, uh, you um, put 5% of the new clients on the new version each hour. Mm -hmm. And to, to make it happen, you also need a fault tolerance framework. And this is also something that we have in Cumulus EE also for quite a while now. Yeah, so you need all those. Back to the, uh, back to the uh, routing story. So you will have your own DSL, like where you can specify declaratively what to do. What happens with the file? It gets consumed by what? I mean, you know, this is your DSL and it has to be understood by someone. So you will have to deploy the configuration. Let's say 5% of the traffic goes there. Um, so I, I, I would say Istio will have to understand in some point of time your DSL, right? Well, we, 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 we translate exactly. what we are working on now. Yeah, we, we are experimenting with that. Yeah. We are experimenting with that. We are we are working on this. This is not part of the Cumulus EE framework yet. We haven't submitted it to the open source yeah. yet, but we are working on it. Yeah. So the idea is that we have a really simple configuration, which is then translated in parts to the Istio configuration, parts to the Kubernetes configuration, and then, you know, um, with um, uh, uh, with 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 the discovery service, we have also introduced the client side load balancing and client side proxy in the Cumulus EE framework. So, the client, if it connects to a, to a, another service, well, this service is then delivered to the discovery framework, mm -hmm. and uh, in the discovery framework, we can do load balancing, we can do some fault tolerance things, and we can also measure. Uh, the traffic which goes through, and we we def what, what we definitely also do there is control the versions, which version of a microservice is bound to which client, mm -hmm. and um, this is then integrated with the fault tolerance mechanisms. And one of the services start is starting to fail, then all the clients are automatically rejected to the older version, mm -hmm. and this works quite good. 
once you have the APIs which are backward compatible. But this is not in Kubernetes deployment, right? Because in Kubernetes, this will be the ingress controller, what you provided. In Kubernetes, this would be the English controller. This is what I told that mm -hmm. if you use Kubernetes, the discovery service is well, with Istio. Okay. So I mean, if yeah. you are deploying yeah. Cumulus to Kubernetes, you would rely on Istio and the Ingress controller. And if you right. are not, don't have Kubernetes, then Cumulus becomes the Kubernetes. Well, Cumulus has some of the features which allow this behavior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we still have quite a few clients which have these Java applications. Some of them are migrated to microservices. We do a lot of software modernization projects. Mm -hmm. And then parts of the large Java E applications are already uh, um, modernized and uh, re-implemented as microservices, but parts are still working on Java E app servers, such as, I don't know, uh, web logic uh, or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask and, you a question, but uh, your GitHub. Uh already answered the question. So MicroPower fault tolerance um, is, the, or, or Cumulus E fault tolerance is fully, fully supports MicroPower fault tolerance. So it means I could actually pick the Cumulus fault tolerance implementation and it would be MicroPower compliant, which is great. Yeah, there is also a long history of the, of the Cumulus E fault tolerance. First, we did our own implementation um, we used some of the Netflix modules and so on, and then MicroProfile started to work on the specifications and then we aligned with the MicroProfile. So it's quite a long history of that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to point out is basically that uh, some of our clients are still using so mix of uh, traditional uh, uh, app server application, which is partly converted to microservices. And in those scenarios, um, well, they are not really interested in using Kubernetes, which adds another layer of complexity. And in, th in those scenarios, we use some of those modules. So basically that we provide similar functionality without all the complexity of the Kubernetes environment. Yeah. So it, it has its use cases, yeah. It has, uh, I, that was another, uh, I see there is, Cumulus Z version, and there is Cumulus Logs, another stuff we didn't talk about, right? Yeah, right. Cumulus Logs is also an interesting uh, module um, because um, once you start doing Docker and particularly Kubernetes and later on serverless, it becomes essential that your logs are sent somewhere that they don't read uh, stuck in a file in the, in a Docker container or whatever. And it is quite a while, yeah. This logs was also one of the first modules which we added to Cumulus E, and we use it in almost all projects. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to send the logs to some distributed log management uh, 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 software, uh, mm -hmm. such as uh, Elastic Stack. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we first used this Elk Stack. Now we are supporting also the Fluent D mm -hmm. uh, instead of Logstash, yeah. Uh, so a f k k uh, uh, stack yeah mm -hmm. uh, but the 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 framework is modular so you could basically send the logs where, wherever you like yeah mm -hmm. uh, then we also have the metrics framework this is also something which uh, uh, is not uh, part of the micro profile spec uh, so sending the metrics to the prometheus uh, of kubernetes yeah mm -hmm. This was also some of the early requirements once we started working with Kubernetes, and and it also works quite well. So it's it's much easier to monitor the the how the microservices are working. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I also found was Cumuluzi Ethereum. We are working on quite a few blockchain projects. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Some of them are this uh, Horizon 2020 European funded projects. Some of them are commercial projects. Yeah, and most of them we use Ethereum. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have built there a module which simplifies integration with Java, with, with Java microservices. Yeah. And uh, maybe an what do you see the part. killer use cases of, of blockchain and microservices? Is this something you can so just know some ideas where you can use it? Well, we have now been quite heavily involved in some uh, energy sector projects where we do the trading with uh, electrical energy and uh, we are experimenting with 
with solutions which basically use blockchain so decentralized um, in a way that all the transactions are stored on the blockchain uh, which is which is quite interesting uh, and it makes a lot of sense because particularly in Europe there are a lot of distributors uh, and and other authorities which take part in this process and sometimes it's difficult to 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 get somebody who would be the central authority and in those cases uh, a de- decentralized blockchain approach really makes sense mm-hmm. however there are still quite a few challenges particularly we have just now been testing uh, 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 the scalability of such solution and uh, the microservice part scales very well, uh, but the blockchain part has its limitations on how quickly the transactions can be stored to the ledger. And this is where some of the bottlenecks arise. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, actually a podcast with uh, Kevin Vitek. He's one of the uh, Ethereum gurus. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the episode 145 with Kevin Vitek. And he works right. on, uh, he, he's the head of blockchain lab, University of Applied Sciences in Gelsenkirchen. And he just does Ethereum the whole time with Java. Wow. So t- today could be some synergies, but he's a uh, Java guy, also open-minded to, towards MicroProfile. So, and you can pick him or, uh, listen to the episode 145, where we covered, you know, the entire Ethereum stuff and, um, and uh, about Remix and the, you know, all the, Ethereum mainnet and Ethereum classic and um, yeah and the virtual machine of Ethereum episode 145. Perfectly, oh. I definitely will. Yeah, and he also created the um, test containers. So the Kevin Vitek is also behind the test containers framework. So interesting guy. Also plays in heavy metal band. So is uh, also interesting. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but you are also a professor. Are you playing also in heavy metal band? No. No, I'm not. No, oh, okay. So no, no. no I but I, I like to listen to heavy metal and. Rock oh really? Well, at least something, yeah, you know. I so uh, I do. I do. Okay. <laughs> so I already covered. Uh, let's say I think uh, already I just t- took some notes. I would say twelve interesting cumulus modules, which I you know, wrote down right now, which is uh, interesting. So it's uh, quite an really interesting project. So now the question: Can you know listeners of the of the podcast buy something from you? So I mean, you, are you selling something cumulus related? Can you can you buy you know I don't know services or support or are you earning money with cumulus or is it just you know leisure? Well, the cumulus EE framework, this is the microservice framework, is completely free. We only sell support, so okay. we have quite a few clients which use this production wise, and we we offer support twenty four seven and so on. But uh, what 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 the listeners could do, they can come to you and say, listen. Uh, this was an interesting episode, Episode, but I would like to have configurable with uh, feature toggles built in, microservice for Tor and framework running on Kubernetes. Help us with it, with support. So you could do this, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. And we so- have some other parts of the Cumulus uh, uh, platform which go beyond the microservice framework. We have our own API management tool, and then we have an integration, a really lightweight integration platform and so on. So if somebody is interested, they, they could have a look at our web page. So then I will have to reinvite you back in half a year again and just talk, you know, about the Kubernetes and lightweight API, which are still doing. So it seems like the more we talk, the the, the more stuff is you now uh, surfacing what, what, you, what you actually implemented, implemented. Well, it's interesting stuff, you know. I, I'm a professor and I like to dig uh, yeah. and to find new ways how to develop software. And this is really something which fascinates me and... Uh, we are trying to 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 move the limits, or how to say, you know, to mm-hmm. to to go beyond what is what is usual approach. And yeah, well, uh, it's always fun to discuss this with you. Yeah, and this hour goes by just like that. What a just a final topic or observation. It was not. I just I, I was just curious to know uh, the uh, what the JavaScript and Python and the scripting uh, developers are doing with the clouds and serverless. And uh, what I noticed is, and this may be, you know, the confusion in the Java Java camp always was. Um, I don't know whether you remember. So the Microsoft started uh, TypeScript or they invested in TypeScript because they couldn't deliver or it was hard to implement Office as a web app or, or parts of the Office. So they wanted to have something like Java to big to 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 build bigger apps. So what I suspect is, if you just pick 
stock JavaScript, on stock Python. It is a way harder to build monolithic systems with such languages because, let's say, in JavaScript, this was like, a, 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 I knew that, but you know, you have to think about it. So in JavaScript, you cannot overload the parameters, right? So you have, have only one function with, uh, with the name. And it, I mean, it, it becomes in one point of time harder. So it is way easier with scripting languages to ship more modules. Because what you get with scripting languages then is something like, I would say, Java packages or something which we always had, but they don't have it. So th they are happy that they, they can write small scripts and ship them as, let's say, microservices. In Java, we don't have such problem. So I have to say, what I have, the problem, the only problem we have with, with Monolith is, is my opinion, they are over-engineered. So developers spend too much time with isolation and all this stuff, so no one is able to find the business logic anymore. So if we would just write simpler code in Java, we can we could ship uh, larger modules um, than, let's say, comparable JavaScript and Python, and even one larger, let's say, AWS Lambda, right, is is cheaper than two smaller Lambdas. So That's what right. I mean is, uh, actually, the strength of cloud native Java would be to, you know, we had the conversation, to focus more or on the logical modularization and be more, more productive and even be cheaper and faster because let, let's let's say technically AWS, let's say we have one, one Lambda function, AWS, which is a little bit more complex than two simple Lambdas. Because it's more complex, it, uh, it is invoked more because it's not like single purpose Lambda. It maybe it has two or three purposes, like, you know, JAXRS resources, not like a just get. It could do get, post, put, and all, all the others. What it means is it is invoked more frequently. If it is invoked more frequently, we don't have the call start problem anymore. If you don't have the call start problem, now we are saving actively money with Java because the hotspot optimized everything once. And you have the you know the the so the the JavaScript and 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 Python problem at, and every invocation so Java becomes cheaper. So what I observed the last year because I was really curious why we are so crazy about microservice because we don't have the problem and what's you know the the story of Python JavaScript and what else so we have the two main scripting language right I would say Python and JavaScript is I would say what's 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 uh, is now in the cloud and what struck me is that it's really hard to build large systems with with um, scripting languages, I would say it is a little bit challenging to write large, simple system with Java, but it's absolutely doable. So I see more and more such systems. So we are in a huge advantage in the Java world. But if we start, you know, to to mimic what the scripting languages are doing, we will lose the battle because then we will write, you know, one line functions with Java, which comes with, you know, all the overhead. But um, what you shouldn't un underestimate is the overhead of, you know, of uh, deploying something to the cloud because you need the YAML, you need you know the the IAMS uh, policy, the security, and all the stuff. So the larger the module, the lower the overhead. So I would say there is something in it, and I do it already for my clients, and they are happy. But I never could you know point what's actually the problem, what's the difference, and I think I got it now a little bit. What's your opinion on this? Well, that's that's interesting what you are saying. Well. Um, I believe that all those languages have their place, you know. Uh, yeah. Java should not co compete native with Python, no, with Node.js or JavaScript, because uh, on the back end, there are some scenarios where Java simply wins. There are some other functionalities which you don't want to write in Java. We did some prepping of, of web pages. We used Python, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we, we would never do this in, in Java, for example. Now, about the granularity, um, what you said with Lambda and so on, it certainly makes sense. But uh, uh, what, what I was wondering is the, 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 the initial premise is that uh, each microservice should have one fu function, one business function and so on. But, but what I really mean is that uh, it depends how large the project is. If there is one or two developers using microservices, it doesn't make sense. Or, or in most cases, it doesn't make sense. But once you have a larger team, it comes down not only to scalability, but particularly how you can parallelize work. So how many teams can work in parallel and how quickly can they move and how, how many interactions they need between the teams. And in larger projects, which we are part of, 
the, these wins, you know. Uh, no, what I was talking was, um, let's say if you look at the uh, examples from Python and JavaScript and, and okay. serverless, what okay. they are proposing, let's say we have a REST endpoint authors. What I would do in Java, I would create a JAXOR as resource and say get post put delete whatever I had. I have four 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 methods HTTP methods. Four right? methods, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I would I would ship yeah. one one lambda with four methods. What the JavaScript and Python will do, they will ship four lambdas. So if you look at the architecture patterns, they would have one lambda for get post put and, and so forth. So they are going to be four times more chatty regarding configuration as we are and for us this microservice will be still tiny you know a microservice right. with one jack store as resource is tiny in my opinion it's not like you know it is tiny but it is already it is. so no and, and i would say nothing against shipping two tiny resources in one such a service so what i'm saying is if we would you know strip down 80 percent of our monolith to such smaller microservices they would be still orders of magnitude larger than the scripting languages, but this is an advantage. We should not it mimic right now. Is this, is, this is what I'm talking. It's not like I said, yeah. you know, ship a huge project with five modules. No, but if there are 50 modules and the JavaScript guys would ship, you know, 500. So now we have advantage. But what you described right now, so that the REST service breaks down into four uh, different services, microservices, I think this is a bad practice. This, it is this bad, but, this is, but, it's, but it's, sold, it's sold as a best practice everywhere. I don't believe this will really make it through as a best practice. No, this, I don't This is not either. a design pattern, and it will make maintenance even more complex. You know? yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because even if you have an author, you know, and the author is a domain object, you will have to maintain it four times because, you know, maybe sometimes yeah. in Get you only would need one attribute in post more attributes, but this is an exception. This is not, yeah, perfect. Right. So this was my right. final thought, you know, uh, with you. Yeah, so. And this, this is a thought where I agree with you completely. And Java should not go this way. This contradicts with the design patterns, definitely. Perfectly. Yeah. So where people can find you, Cumulus, or where can they buy support from you? Well, they, they can look at our web page, ee.cumulus.com. Uh, there are also some contacts. They can find me on LinkedIn or over my email. So Yeah, I will just copy, you know, them. your your coordinates from the earlier podcast. So Great. Thank, thank you a lot. Great. And I will invite you Adam, back in spring or winter. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it and have a nice day. Thank you Bye. for being part of your air hacks. Goodbye. Bye.